Welcome back to another episode of your hope-filled perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Bankson, and I'm so excited about this episode today. Even if this does not specifically pertain to you, you have friends and family members that it pertains to, so I'm glad you're here. Today, we are going to be talking about maintaining hope while waiting for a loved one to be saved. I want to start off today's episode with 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15, that says, this is the confidence we have in him. That is, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, We know that we have the request we have asked of him. My guest is my friend, Benny Yeximan, and she is a child of the king, a wife of 42, mother of four, and a grandmother of eight. She's a disaster relief chaplain and works as an enrichment specialist for a nursing home. Her passion is sharing God's love and truth with a faith in his faithfulness and his promises. She lives with a hope for her lost family and friends and finds it her calling to pray in faith for them. Bunny and I met many years ago over a campfire and we talked about her amazing story and I knew that one day we would connect again so that she could share her story with our audience today. So you are in for a treat. Welcome to the program, Bunny. Thank you. I'm so excited and honored to be here today. I'm so glad you're here because you are a walking, breathing testimony of what it looks like to keep praying in faith for our family members who are not yet saved. You know, we were, we met at a retreat several years ago and I was captivated at dinner one night hearing you share your story about how you married a Muslim who eventually came to know Jesus as a savior. Will you share with our audience that story? Oh, I am excited to share this story because it is so remarkable when you can watch what God does in another person's life. It's, you know, I know what he did for me and I know how he brought me to him, but to be able to be part of the journey of somebody else and see God work in their life, that's absolutely not just incredible, but an honor and a gift from God. So um, yes, I met my husband. Um, I was a believer, he was an unbeliever. In fact, he was raised in Iran, he was a Muslim. Uh, Came to the United States when he was 18 years old and he denounced his faith and he got involved with, uh, became an atheist and got involved with Marxist and Leninism. And yet I was a college girl and I was falling in love and I was going to change him and he was going to be my, my mission. And, um, but little did I realize that, you know, I still believe this day that he was always meant to be my right man, but God had a plan that I stepped out of the order of, Mm -hmm. and his order was always share Christ first than me, but I did me. And I had to wait 20 years for him to um, to fi- finally surrender to Christ. So um, we got married and, you know, we went through this, this journey of him not understanding. He just, he could not comprehend how I could have a relationship with almighty God. Okay. And that I would know that I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to go to heaven. And so this irritated him and it got worse. And then um, as the kids were born, boy, that passion in me got stronger because I wanted my kids to know Jesus. And though my husband didn't withhold me from going to church, he didn't make it pleasant. And I would go and he would feel pretty um, convicted, not convicted, but irritated that um, God was more important than him. Mm And one day the Lord just really spoke to my heart and said, Bunny, I want you to stay home today. And I want you to let your husband know 
that is my gift to him that you are home, that I say it's okay. So it's not a preachy moment. It's not a moment of, oh, but this is what God says and this is what you do. It wasn't like that. It's like when he said, would you just stay home? And I looked at him, okay. And he was shocked. I bet. And I said, you know, the Lord said that I, it's okay for me to stay home with you. And so I will. I didn't talk about that anymore. But as the time went on, I began, I just stayed home. Nobody believed that it was right. Um, the church didn't agree with it. My husband, I mean, my, my dad didn't agree with it. He told me, he says, what are you, your own pastor teacher, you know? And I said, no, it's the Holy Spirit. Always has been, always will be. Um, but this is okay. And I stayed home and we began to read the Bible together. And I thought everything was going well. And, um, but it, he actually, when my son was two years old, actually asked Christ to be his Lord and Savior, right? And I thought, oh, this is great. But actually things got worse. Mm -hmm. um, he tells me today that it was because he was trying to keep peace. So it wasn't a true transformation. Um, and so what happened at that point was the most incredible journey because I had at that point been praying and praying and praying, God, save my husband, save my husband, save my husband, please, God, please. I'm begging God. I'm weeping and I'm going to the altar every Sunday morning, every single Sunday morning, praying for my husband. And one day when my, my old, now my kids are all in um, junior high, high school now, and they're away on a mission trip and I'm on my knees praying and crying again when I hear God speak to my heart in this quiet but firm voice get up and don't ask me again whoa I was like wait a minute doesn't it say in first Thessalonians 5 16 about pray persistently yes. so what is that supposed to mean what do you mean don't ask but this is when he made me understand something that when we pray we can either we can have we have two ways of praying we can either pray with faith or pray in doubt mm. and we're often like the little children who come to mama and say mama can i go to the park and she says later mama five minutes later can we go to the park later after lunch mama another 10 minutes later Mama finally gets very firm and direct, looks in that child's eyes and says, you asked me again and we're not going. Yeah. <laughs> now there's, there's a few reasons why a child would do that. I mean, it's because either they don't believe you or they're just being extremely impatient or they want to control you. They want to be in charge. And this is what the Lord was saying I was doing. I wasn't praying in faith. I was praying in doubt. I kept asking and asking and asking. So what he revealed to me was that I must ask in faith without any doubting that what God's will is to be done will be done. So the important part of that was that he wanted me to understand what his will was. Yeah. And, you know, and he tells me his will is the unsharing than one. So if I'm I could pray again. God's... Say that again, huh? his will is what? His, his desire is that none would perish, not even one. Okay. He says, it's my desire that none should perish, not even one. That, after all, isn't that why he came to the earth? Right. He came to give his life for the world. So if I even to pray, the very first scripture you read was one of the most profound scriptures for me, because this scripture tells me, I am to pray God's will. And if I am praying his will, I can have the confidence that he is going to answer that. Yes. Well, yes. if I know what his will is, then I can pray it. I can believe it and I can expect it. So at that point, I realized I could continue to pray for my husband, but now my prayer would change. Mm. It would be no more. God, please save my husband. It would now be, God, thank you for saving my husband. And this is before I see it because faith is, has a, gives you an assurance, right? But faith isn't after you see it, it's before you see it. 
Right. I continued going to altar out of a promise I made to God to pray for my husband, mm -hmm. but I went to the altar praying Thanksgiving. And, you know, here, you, you, sometimes we think we're going to change somebody else. But what God did is he changed me yeah. and my perspective. You see, we can't prove God to someone. God proves himself. Mm -hmm. And he also says that man is without excuse. He, in, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter one, I believe it's verse 18. He begins talking about how I've already given every example of my existence to man and therefore man is without excuse yeah so if that's his responsibility not mine my responsibility was to love my husband right where he was for as long as it took regardless of what he said now what if my husband says i am never going to believe in god this thing is, this whole thing is a farce. You're just afraid. You're just scaredy cat. Um, it, it's just a crutch. Well, this is what the unbeliever says to us. So, yeah. And the Lord said, um, you, you don't trust what man says. You trust what I say. So no matter what journey they're on, and it doesn't make any difference. They can look at me and say, I'm never going to believe. They go, yeah, you are. How do you know? Because God told me. Really? Sure. <laughs> I mean, there is not, if I have my faith is in God right. and what his word said, he tells me to be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to let my request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So at that, at that turning point, I was able to now live with my husband in peace, no matter what he said, no matter what he did, because my faith wasn't in his words or in his actions, but they were in the promises of God and his faithfulness. And where is your husband today? Where is my husband today? Well, I have to tell you that it is absolutely an amazing thing that today my husband not only is serving the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, but he's committed his life to serving him. Um, we moved from Oklahoma to Kansas to go to seminary. Um, he's, but, uh, I gotta be honest. There's not a lot of people that want a 62 year old pastor. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. 64 year old pastor. Um, but the Lord has opened a door at our nursing home because of COVID and the churches that were coming are no longer coming. Um, uh, my husband volunteered. So my husband has his own little opportunity to touch some incredible, precious lives with Christ. And every Sunday, he leads the service. I lead the worship. Praise God. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, but I want to step back for just a second because you mentioned that you were unequally yoked when you got married, meaning that you were a Christian and you married someone with much different beliefs who was not a Christian. And I've heard you say, and you shared with our audience today that you were in love. And you thought it was your mission field to save him. So knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to young people who are dating and considering marriage? Well, that's, that's a huge one because um, unfortunately, we, we tell our kids, um, I, I mean, I was told growing up, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't do this. But it was just another do not do yeah. without an understanding of what that looks like and why God gave us that. Um, it really is a means of protection. So if you really want to have a marriage that is good, because marriages are hard regardless, That's right? right? Um, two sinful people coming together and trying to be one. I mean, there's a, there's a battle, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if, if they really want to have a, a good marriage, 
Christ has got to be the core. He's got to be the center. And the only way that's going to happen is to make sure you only date a believer. Um, I've had people say to me, but look at you, look at your marriage work. I go, my marriage is working, but was, I remember laying in my bed next to my husband one day, this was after he was a believer and I apologized. I said, I want to apologize to you. He said, for what? Withholding blessing from you. Because I really believe I got in God's way and you would have been a believer before we married had I not got un- gotten in God's way. Mm-hmm. But when we get in his way, we hinder the process. Gotta move out of the way. Let God be God. I'm not. And I mess it up. And obviously I did, <laughs> you know, but obviously he was still faithful. You know, so for kid, for young people, I know they think I'm just dating. It's nothing. You don't know who you are going to emotionally connect to that's right. and feel like that's who you want to be with the rest of your life. If you don't take that serious now, you will go through some very difficult battles, especially after children come. Yeah. We've you always know? told our kids that when you date, you give away part of your heart yes, and you take part of their heart and <sighs> you have to be so careful. Yep. And, and my kids have seen it. You know, one of my yes. sons, he, he experienced that heartbreak. And I said, this was what I was trying to share with you. Now you understand because you can't get that back. So be very careful who you give part of your heart to. Well, and it's important too, because in John, it talks about God being love. It says, God is love. So without him in your life, you cannot fully experience what real love is. So light and darkness cannot mix. Well, love and lust do not mix either. Because without God, that's basically what we're dealing with is the lust of the flesh. But Love is different when God is involved because it's something that's deeply rooted. It's something that says, I'm going to keep going. My love for God kept me in my marriage, not my love for my husband. I wanted to walk away. But God tells me that because I was unequally yoked, I couldn't leave my husband. Now, had he left me, I would have been free. But had I left him, my children would have become unsanctified. I had to remain and I had to remain in a way, not as a doormat, not as a carpet, not as um, somebody's possession. I had to remain, not even to try to change him, but I had to remain in obedience to God so that God would bless my obedience because I had already made my errors. But we got to remember God is merciful. Yeah. And he's so full of grace. And he took my mess and made it into my message. Mm-hmm. And that's what all of us have an opportunity to do. Because none of us have a perfect life. <laughs> Boy, isn't that the truth? <laughs> Friends, we've got so much more to talk about After this commercial break, we're going to talk even more about maintaining hope while we're waiting for a loved one to be saved. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your Hope-Filled Perspective, where today we are talking with my friend, Benny Yexman, about how to maintain hope while we're waiting for a loved one to be saved. Before the break, Bunny was sharing about her marriage and how she married someone who was not a Christian at the time. Thankfully, he now loves and serves the same God that she does. But we want to talk today about how can you hold on to that hope when you have friends and loved ones who are not yet saved. Bunny, you mentioned before the break about it's not our job to prove God to our loved ones. It, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it's so easy. I just came from a family reunion and I wanted so badly to, to show, to prove. 
this is why I love God. This is why I serve God. This is who God is. But I don't want to get in God's way. So talk a little bit more about that. You know, that was a, that was a lesson that I had to learn the hard way um, in many ways, not just with my husband, but with children, with um, fam- other extended family members. And I remember the one day the Lord said, Bunny, what you need to do, you don't have to prove me. I will do that. What you have to do is prove my love. You need to love regardless of how they respond to it. My love to to him was not about whether I would be able to receive it back in the same manner. It wasn't about whether it was going to change him or make our life a piece of cake, you know. Um, It was about being obedient to God because God loved me so much. I mean, here's the reality. If, If I'm going to be able to minister to the lost, I have to remember I was once there. Yes. I have to remember the ugliness of who I am without Christ. I know who I am without him. I know where I would probably, I would probably be down under way down six feet a long time ago without him. So it's, if I can understand who I am in him, who I am without him, because of who he is, then I look at everybody else in a whole different light. Yeah. I don't have to prove God to my, to my lost loved ones, <clears throat> excuse me, because God will do that. He just wants me to love them. Let, if I can love them like he loves me, to make me feel valued, to make me feel like I have a place in this world, most people, that's all they want. That's why they ask all the questions. That's why they're running away. You know, God tells us that man is without excuse, that he is he has made man to understand and to know God. They are without excuse. So it is not about really that they don't believe. It's about the fact that they're simply rejecting the truth they already know. Wow. I do not believe there's a single man, woman, or child on the face of this earth that truly does not believe there's a God, the God. They just reject it. And that is their choice to where they will spend eternity. So if I can love them the way God loves, um, the, the most beautiful example, and this is a little bit off, but it was the example of that love I'm talking about. Um, I was on the mission field in um, Romania and I uh, was with a group of people. I was the only American, the only woman, and they were sharing their testimony with this little 82 year old woman. And um, she had been raised in a communist country. Um, the church had been control of communists. She'd never seen anything but death and destruction by the church. They share their testimony. She didn't receive it. And I just started crying. And I was like, I'm, I'm sobbing. This woman is rejecting Christ right now. And she may not have any more time. And the Lord moved in my heart to do one thing. Get on my knees, get in front of her, hold her hands, look her straight in the eye and tell her that he loves her. And that he loved her so much that he sent me from the other side of the world to tell her. She began to cry. She began to ramble off and said nobody's ever loved me like this before nobody's ever cried for me before I want Jesus wow and I found out later she was a persecutor of the church I had no clue but God knew and and so in all reality my husband will tell you the same thing I found hope in Jesus and in the love that he expressed to me through the love of someone else. We are the hands, the feet, the heart of Christ. And when we share that, people have a hard time rejecting it. So how do we keep from being impatient, waiting for my loved one to receive Christ? There's only one thing that can help us with that. 
and that is getting in the word. If we do not know God, it's because we don't know his word. Because it's filled with promise after promise after promise. And I, I mean, I've got them all over this place. If you could see them, promise after promise after promise. If I don't want to just believe in God, I want to believe him. And that means if I believe him, I'm going to hide his word in my heart, not just so that I don't sin against him, but so that I can walk with faith, with confident assurance that God will do absolutely everything he says he'll do. If I believe that, that scripture, that if I pray his will, it will be done. Then I walk in hope and confidence. It, and that's why I don't have to worry about what somebody tells me they're going to believe or not believe. I'm like, you're doomed. I've already played for you <laughs> and given. <laughs> I was just going to say, how do I handle it when my loved one says, I'll never believe? I just, okay. I know different. Okay. I had a cousin. He was, um, he was raised Muslim too. And he said he would never believe. And uh, he had a brain cancer and he had so much um, uh, treatment that he, had like uh, Alzheimer's kind of uh, response in them. I had a burden. I said, Lord, please give him one more chance. I know we've talked and talked and talked to him. Please, Lord, one more chance. The Lord sent me to go see him. Um, and I went, when he opened that door, I went believing. I wasn't going. The Lord says the harvest is ready. The fields are white for the harvest. He didn't say go and plant a seed. He said, go and reap the harvest. So when he said, go reap the harvest, I went believing for the salvation, not, oh, well, maybe I'm going to plant a seed. I'm going to water this. No, I'm not. I'm going to reap because that's what God is sending us to do. And um, I walked in, his wife said, he may not recognize you. He looked at me. He says, bunny. How are you? We sat down. He went from a childlike state to completely alert and said, he asked me if my husband believed in Jesus. My, he's my husband's cousin. And uh, I said, yes. He said, why? And he's talking like you and I are talking right this moment. God gave him complete clarity to communicate with me. And I told him, Jesus came to this earth because he loves you. He simply wants, he put out his hands, put them out this way, but he put out his hand for you to just take it, not to send you to hell, but to save you from it. And it's that simple. And he looked at me as, is it just, you just have to take his hand. He stood up, he looked at me straight in the eye and he says, okay, I want to do it. And I said, you want to do what? <laughs> he goes, I want to accept Jesus. I said, okay, well, let's pray. I couldn't get a word out. We bowed our heads. He prayed, asked Jesus to be his savior. Then he sat back down and went right back into his childlike state. He never forgot it, though. Every person in the next four days, you know, he might have remembered to tell me about somebody I hadn't met, although I had. But he never forgot. And he kept telling people, I was Muslim, but now I am Christian. And I'm like, that's got at work. And that's, it's, it's the love we share with them of the Christ, the hope of Christ, the promise of Christ, and the expectation that God is going to do exactly what he says he will do. And that will give you the greatest hope to carry you through that whole journey. Friends, I want you just to camp on that for a minute. We're going to take a real quick commercial break, but as we do, I want you to reflect on what Bunny's sharing. We don't have to prove God, but we do have to be obedient when he sends us. Mm -hmm. And we have to stand on the truth of God's word and believe it ourselves before we can expect our loved ones to believe it. Because we will live out what we really believe. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a real quick commercial break, but we'll be back to talk just a little bit more about maintaining hope while we're waiting for a loved one to be safe. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective. Oh my goodness, Bunny, this was a conversation I needed today. 
it's hard when we know the God of all creation, when we know Jesus who came to rescue us and save us for all eternity, we want that for our friends and loved ones. But what you were really sharing today is in standing firm in our faith that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he has said he will do in his word. Not praying in doubt, but praying in faith that God will do as he's promised. For the listener who is listening today and they can identify one to a dozen people. They know that they're burdened. They want to see them in heaven. But they're not sure. How do I begin? Maybe they've never shared their faith before. Can you give one small step that they can begin to implement today? I would say the most important thing for any of us on the journey of sharing our faith or even walking in our own faith is that personal relationship we have with God. We have to spend the time. Sometimes we think of God as a smorgasbord. We want to pick and choose what we want from God. And the thing is, is we're always trying to take and we have to just surrender it all. Um, someone gave me a very great example that whoever that is, whatever that situation, you imagine them in your hand and you say, you know, God, I want you to take this, whether it's a burden for a lost loved one or anything else you're dealing with. But it was for me, it was my husband and I had to put him in my hands. I raised it up and she said, now don't lower your hands until you're ready to let go and let God have it. Well, that visual was very big to me because as I've got my hands raised, I'm like, don't bring them down until I'm ready to let go. That means you can't bring your hand, you can't bring them down with you again. He really wants you to let go and let God. That sounds so easy. And I know that it's not, it's not an easy journey, but it really does begin with where my faith sits with God. If I believe that almighty God has the ability to save my soul, I know he has the ability to save anybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't. I am not the saver. I am not the transformer. God is and only God. If I can just cast, grasp that concept, hold on to that and begin to thank God for being the saver of your loved one, the transformer of their heart. God can take it from there and you will walk in peace. The key is not just to believe in God, but to believe him. Mm. For he is always, always faithful. So as we wrap up this program, the program's called Your Hope Filled Perspective. So if we have a listener who's listening today and they're feeling frustrated or discouraged about the eternal fate of a loved one, what hope-filled perspective do you want to leave them with? I think I want to leave them with um, that scripture. Uh, let me see here. I've got a scripture here I want to leave them with because, you know, God, God's made the promises to us. And if I will hold on to him, with that, you know, Philippians 419 seems like it's a scripture always about the things that we need physically. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 419. This is what I call my blue box um, scripture. Um, it was the one that actually got my husband's attention. But this scripture reminds me that I have a need and you have a need that your loved one comes to know Christ. He's already said he will supply our every need. If we can remember that, hold that. I still have a loved one, my son, who is my prodigal. But what I know that no matter what he says to me to this day, whether he receives Christ before the rapture or after, 
It's not about me seeing it happen. It's about me believing it's going to happen. And I can hold on to that truth that no matter when it is, it will occur, whether I see it or not. My faith isn't what I can see, and it isn't what someone else says. It's who God is, what he promises, and his faithfulness to those promises. Such a good word. Thank you for sharing of your wisdom and your experience, your hurts and your pain, and your faith in God. Friends, I want to leave you with 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If you are praying for a friend or loved one to come to know the saving knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ, you stand on those promises. You claim them as yours because God has said his word will not go out and return void, meaning it, he's going to use his word to accomplish that which he determined it will accomplish. So keep praying in faith, thanking God for the saving grace that he's extending towards your loved one and believe for it, just as Bunny has shared with us today. You keep praying in belief and show God through your love for one another. Friends, if you are blessed to know that your friends and loved ones are going to heaven because they know Jesus as their personal savior, then consider sharing this episode with someone who is aching for a loved one to come to know him. I'm sure that they will be encouraged by Bunny's story and by how firmly she holds on to the word of God, believing it even before she sees it come to pass. Share this episode with them to encourage them and consider subscribing to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode of your hope-filled perspective. This has been a great conversation, Bunny. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Bankson, and I look forward to chatting with you again next week. And until then, may you have a hope-filled week.